Hello, everyone. I'm Sean, a marketing manager here at Mazars USA, and I'd like to thank you for attending our webcast. Today, we will be presenting Raising Capital During a Pandemic, which will be moderated by Alana Dibble, a senior manager at Mazars. Alana will be joined by our featured panelists, Andrew Winner, Vice President at Mangrove Equity Partners, Dan Murray, President at Creator IQ, Scott Hadfield, Managing Director at Elantra, and Scott Rosenblatt, partner at Reitler, Kalis, and Rosenblatt. Before we begin, I'd like to review a housekeeping item. To ask questions, please send them to us using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to answer all of your questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed, or if we run out of time, your question will be answered after the webcast via email. Also, if you need any technical assistance throughout the webcast, please send us a message using the Q&A box. Now, thank you once again for joining, and I'll hand it over to Alana. Thank you, Sean. And thank you for everyone joining our webcast today, particularly for those following our series. COVID has impacted our lives and, and businesses in ways that we could have never imagined. And to navigate through these uncertain times, we're using our industry expertise and knowledge at Mazars to bring you this series of webcasts, highlighting different ways to get your businesses on track and moving forward. Today is the fourth in this series. We're going to dive into the world of private capital and how it's been impacted by COVID. We'll hear from a company that was able to raise capital in the midst of the pandemic, as well as some other industry experts who will provide an outlook on current changes and the future of raising capital. So, of course, I'm thanking our panelists today, and I'm going to give them the opportunity to each introdu introduce themselves and the companies that they're working for. So to kick it off, I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Scott Rosenblatt. Hi, Alana. Thank you very much for having me here today. I look forward to participating. I'm a partner at Reitler, Kalis & Rosenblatt, a corporate law firm with a nationwide practice focused on venture capital, emerging companies, and mergers and acquisitions. We consistently rank in the top 10 most active VC firms in the PitchBook rankings. This webcast is particularly relevant to our practice, as we have been assisting both investment funds and companies in dealing with the effects of the pandemic for the last six months in connection with both investments and exit transactions. Thank you, Scott. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Andrew, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Good morning, everyone. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and speak with everyone virtually. Uh, my name is Andrew Winner. I'm a vice president at Mangrove Equity Partners. We are a Tampa, Florida-based lower middle market private equity firm that was founded in 2005. Um, the vast majority of the transactions that we pursue are ones where we are the first institutional capital um, partnering with the entrepreneur or family that owns the existing business and helping them facilitate some sort of transition plan as their businesses scale through an inflection point. Um, we focus on traditionally old economy businesses, so manufacturing, industrial services, some consumer products. Um, and in terms of size, typically our sweet spot um, are deals under 50 million of revenue. Thank you, Andrew. It's also good to have you. And Scott, Scott Hadfield, I'm going to move it over to you. And you, you're giving me a challenge today to have to have two Scots on the panel of four. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, this is Scott Hadfield. I'm a managing director with Elantra, an investment banking firm uh, that is a global firm focused on the middle market. We're in 26 countries, so we we raise capital throughout the world, um, typically. Um, 1.5 billion to $2 billion annually. Uh, the capital raising group that, that I'm part of um, is about 35 people throughout the world of our most major cities uh, in the US uh, and in Europe. And um, we focus on transactions. Typically our clients have enterprise values from 40 million, $300 million. Thank you, Scott. And Dan, I'm gonna turn it, turn it over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you. Yes, my name is Dan Murray. I am the president of Creator IQ. Creator IQ is a BB SaaS platform that helps marketers manage and scale their influencer marketing programs. As uh, has been alluded to, 
we raised money uh, during the pandemic. We raised our Series C. Uh, so happy to speak about uh, that experience. I am also a venture partner at Calibrate Ventures. Calibrate Ventures invests in automation and robotics, typically at the Series A uh, level. And uh, we look for companies that are post uh, revenue um, uh, stage. Thank you, Dan. And it, it's great to hear about your capital raise, raise during the pandemic. So we'll hear from more of you throughout the webcast. So really today to kick it off, a good place to start is to think about what's in the eye of the investor. How has the investor changed from pre-pandemic to, uh, to the pandemic now and uh, what the impact on deals are? So Scott Hadfield, I'm going to shift it to you first to get your initial perspective on the investor in the current times. Sure. Um, I've, I've been raising capital, both debt and equity for almost 25 years. And I don't, obviously we've had recessions and, and periods when it was difficult to raise capital, but no, nothing like the pandemic that all of us experienced where essentially the, the economy shut down, um, people stopped looking at new opportunities for investment. And I think what we've seen, obviously, is the, the businesses that have performed well during the, the COVID period, investors uh, have continued to transact and look very highly on those businesses um, to invest capital. But we have a huge subset of the economy uh, and companies that are, remain impacted. Um, you know, the PPP program helped provide capital for, you know, the summer period. Most of that capital is now Pretty, pretty much deployed and used. So we have a whole subset of the economy that is uh, continuing to struggle, uh, that is having a very challenging time raising capital. They lack, obviously, their, their revenues are down and they lack visibility on when their business will come back, which has made that group very challenging you know, for capital raising. So it really, from the investor standpoint, um, you know, the investors are very focused on how is the company perform, how is the company formed in this COVID environment? How is the visibility um, going forward for that business? And how in that how has the industry changed? You know, is this is there a, a major shift in the industry such that um, you know this is a different you know a different type of industry going forward and a, a different way to play the industry? Is that company still going to be a leader going forward? So. Investors have, you know, it's it's obviously there's a lot to look at, um, and particularly, you know, even the businesses performing well, is it a one time, is it a bump, or is it sustainable? So there's a lot of questions, obviously, investors are looking at and get themselves. Yeah, definitely a, a different view for them this these days, and a lot of uncertainty to take into into consideration. And Dan, it would be good to hear from you. Uh, on your perspective of the investor and, and what has changed? Yeah, I have two perspectives. One, um, being an operator who uh, raised money, we were started our, our fundraising process in, in February, uh, but in reality, the process has been going on for um, two years because we've cultivated relationships over that period of time. We've kept uh, investors, <laughs> potential investors informed about uh, our business. So when we began the fundraising process in fe February, it was really a continuation. Unfortunately for us, we asked for term sheets in uh, early to mid-March, and uh, we all know what happened then. In, in our situation, uh, we did have investors that uh, <coughs> stuck with us. Uh, we had uh, some term sheets that came in and were later uh, pulled because of the uncertainty, and then others that were very much expected that they just didn't show up. So we had to deal with you know, less demand, uh, but uh, we did get the deal done, and we're uh, very happy with the investor that we had, uh, that we got. Uh, so the, the, there was definitely alignment philosophically, so that was really important. What I would say since then, my uh, perception, what I'm seeing on the on uh, the Calibrate side is that uh, deals are getting done. Uh, Calibrate was always open for business, even in the, in the worst of times, but there were fewer opportunities that were being presented in, in the April, May timeframe. 
And, and we saw a lot more uh, robustness uh, in um, Q3, and we recently closed three deals. So uh, markets are open for business uh, from my perspective, but it is uh, people are more skeptical and they're looking more carefully at investments, especially if your business is impacted by COVID either favorably or unfavorably, people will look skeptically at your numbers. If you had a big bump, is this a short-term bump just because COVID or is it really sustainable? So that adds complexity. Yeah, it's definitely a, a challenge looking forward because there are a lot of industries right now with those peaks. And is it due to COVID or is it gonna sustain after COVID? Scott Roosevelt, I'm going to pass it over to you and, and see, do you have a similar experience with Scott and Dan? And what are you seeing the impacts on the actual deals? Sure. Uh, this is an unusual time in that most, and I'll speak from the perspective of earlier stage companies, will have planned out from their different raises anywhere from six to 12 months worth of runway. Cash that they would have planned to have to execute their business is running out. Now that was extended by the PPP loans, which many of the companies were able to secure, but those days are gone now. So you're seeing a lot of companies who are facing rather aggressive valuations in dealing with investors at this point. You're seeing some companies forced into exit transactions where they would have otherwise relied on the capital markets to extend the time period to grow their companies before an exit. You're seeing a lot of pivots. You're seeing a lot of forced recaps from existing investors who are putting money in, but uh, compelling others to do so and, uh, you know, with severe ramifications if the other investors do not. And, uh, you know, it, it's a difficult, challenging time across the board, obviously more difficult for the companies who have a, a greater uh, impact from the pandemic. But even those who are, it's, it's rather neutral, it's still a very competitive environment. And it really depends on the industry you're in. There are some exceptions to that. We're seeing uh, you know, an easier path for the companies that are in e-commerce, remote access technologies, streaming, at-home entertainment, gaming, software in general, which isn't as impacted by this. And we're seeing tremendous impacts on companies that rely on brick and mortar retail, any type of real estate, travel, transportation. You know, they're facing a very tough time in, in continuing to raise capital. Thank you, Scott. And Scott Hatfield, are, are you seeing the same types of industries and the same impacts? I know you had some particular examples of industries that were succeeding so far during the pandemic. Sure. Yeah, I think Scott touched on um, a lot of the industries that are performing well and, and obviously many that are many, many that are challenged. Um, we're seeing that across our firm globally. Um, you know, there was a shift to technology. Um, uh, this was brought on by COVID. Um, I think that accelerated a, a lot of those moves. And um, so obviously that, you know, our technology practice is is as busy as it's been um, in, in many, many years. Um, so I think the, you know, the other aspect of it, it's it's really, you know, it will take, we, we're very active in, in the food area, for example, food and food ingredients. The food, the you know, the, the stay at home trends with, with cooking at home has obviously benefited food companies that sell at the retail level through supermarkets. Um, on the flip side, um, the food service um, providers uh, have not fared as well. They've come back, but it's still been you know, a challenging environment for, for those folks. We do a lot in the aerospace industry, obviously commercial aviation tremendously impacted negatively. Um, on the military side though, it's, it's a very robust market for raising capital and selling businesses, um, you know, under the Trump administration and the, the the spending that has occurred in the military side. So it really is um, industry to industry, even within sub-industries, um, which ones are obviously, you know, better performers than others. And I'm gonna, gonna turn it over to Andrew, because what I'm hearing here is uh, industries are impacted, but it seems a company co by company basis. So Andrew, what, what are you seeing in terms of the the thoughts of investments, the industries, and, and what's really being looked for in companies that are achieving the investments right now. Yeah, um, and just to echo some of the comments already made, the M&A markets, at least in the private equity world, are certainly open. Um, I feel we're well past the triage stage of um, people looking inward, focusing on their portfolio companies, assessing liquidity, getting PPP loans. So 
Um, there's a lot of dry powder out there and uh, private equity firms are looking for new opportunities. Strategics are also active. Um, a lot of their valuations have rebounded. Interest rates remain low. Um, so the buyer interest is out there. In terms of um, places we're focusing, um, you know, there's always been um, a focus on businesses with recurring or reoccurring revenue um, or very clear and stable demand drivers. I'd say right now there's even more focused on those types of businesses. Um, in particular at Mangrove, um, one of our three core verticals that we focus on is enthusiast-driven consumer products. Um, and we've seen a lot of businesses performing very well in the auto aftermarket subsector, other outdoor and recreational products categories. Um, any of those businesses that have built successful e-commerce channels, so through the pandemic have been able to really drive revenue. Um, but along the lines of some of the points just made, um, these are all sectors that have experienced very significant COVID bumps. Um, and a lot of them have been growing organically prior to the pandemic. So it is tough to tease out what is that COVID impact and how long that will continue. Um, with that, what we are seeing is an expectation to provide full valuations on the current performance, but more of an acceptance of structure in those deals. So the use of other earnouts or performance targets to get the seller to a full valuation. Yeah, because I'm interested to know, you know, how how you uh, have the confidence in a company and and how they can display to you that okay, there's some peaks during COVID, but it's going to continue and uh, into the long term. Is there particular things that you look for to gain that confidence? Yeah, um, you know, with savvy investment bankers on the sell side, you're going if you want to compete in that opportunity, you're going to have to pay off the current run rate or projected performance. Um, so we spend a lot of time really analyzing um, the detailed financial data and the nuts and bolts behind their projections. Um, and what we find very helpful is sellers that can provide that granular data that supports those projections. Um, any sort of forward-looking indicators um, such as you know, pipeline of opportunities, backlog, um, scheduled contracts, those are helpful. Um, but then even beyond the data, um, sellers that can bring to the table um, actionable market intelligence um, and up-to-date market intelligence in terms of their competitors and their customers, um, any voice of the customer studies, you know, things that can provide anecdotal evidence to help us um, really underwrite those projections and know, hey, this isn't a bump, this will continue the rest of the year, next year and beyond. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. And Scott Rosenblatt, are you seeing the, the same things and having the same mindset on what investors are looking for to evidence the growth in these companies outside the COVID impact? Well, you're expanding what the diligence will be on a business level from what would happen outside pandemics, because now you're taking one step further and looking beyond the actual company and who the company depends on, either through vendors or clients, and seeing how they're being impacted. A good example that came up, I think it was Scott H. who brought this up, is in uh, aerospace. You can have a company that's a pure technology play, but it sells its products to, you know, you name the airline or the uh, the airplane manufacturer, and they're seeing the negative impact having nothing to do with their technology or their typical pipeline, but their buyers are seeing such an impact, the users of their products, that it's just detrimental to the future runway of that company. So it requires more digging now to see where the after effect might be of the pandemic beyond just the numbers of the company. Absolutely. And what about companies who have uh, emerged during COVID or they're designing their business model around uh, the, the new times? So say there's some companies doing virtual concerts, uh, for example. Is it thought that, that those types of companies popping up now will stick around in, in the long term or it's 
it's good for now and then they'll kind of uh, you know dwell off later that goes to the larger question of what we're seeing now is this the sign of what will be from this point going forward which impacts everything from commercial real estate leasing to at-home entertainment and if you're seeing that type of uh, impact now will it set the new trend and that's a difficult point for investors i can say from from experience without naming companies that those companies are doing very well as far as attracting investors and high valuations because they're able to make their point to investors that this is going to be the trend going forward. Just picture going into a stadium with 50,000 people right now. That's your pitch point on why the home streaming is a good sell and investors are receptive to that. Yeah, and currently they would have the data data to back up because like you said, I'm not sure uh, people are going to be eager to go out there into the stadiums, but they're still looking for that in-home experience of what they would have fell out of at a concert previously. And Scott Hadfield, do you have the, the, same, the same perspective? Yeah, I think Scott said it well. I think, you know, another aspect of this is, you know, we, we've seen this is the um, companies, this, this allowed companies to evaluate their personnel and how they're using their personnel. So, you know, as, as companies look at where they're going from here, I think a lot of them have realized um, we can probably operate. No one likes layoffs, but, you know, you can, they, you know, there's certainly a case that companies can operate with less personnel. Um, they can be more efficient um, from the office space standpoint. You know, there's a, a, a certainly a view for many companies that they don't quite need the footprint on the office space side that they did before. Um, so I think a company, you know, I'll say growing or being established today has the advantage of looking at it saying, I don't need these number of people uh, in this organization. And, you know, if, if, if you know, from an old economy or older economy company to today transitioning, and I don't need the physical office space footprint that maybe uh, many companies have if, they, if you're starting a new business today or targeting a, an online business um, with some of the areas we've talked about. Thank you, Scott. And Dan, I, I wanted to bring it over to you and, and really start the ball rolling on valuations to see what companies um, are doing in terms of the valuations and how investors are reacting. Are you seeing stability from pre-pandemic or, or there are changes there? Well, um, I guess my uh, largest data set is on the Calvary side. And uh, we are investing in companies that have exits uh, off into the horizon because we're investing in the Series A. We're not seeing a, uh, a material decrease in valuations. Now, the space that we are investing in uh, automation and robotics, it, it's not impacted by COVID. It's still very much on trend. So in, in, that, in that sense, I would say uh, valuations are holding up at least in those categories uh, for that, um, that stage of investment. Thank you. And Andrew, you touched on it earlier, mentioning that the, you were seeing valuations um, being stable, but perhaps the deal structured around it is different. Could you elaborate on that for us, please? Yeah, of course. Um, first, in terms of valuations, um, one of the data sets that we track is published by a company called GF Data. Um, they track middle market M&A valuations, and they publish their Q2 M&A data in the enterprise value to EBITDA valuations were very consistent with prior quarters. Um, the deal count was down, so presumably um, you could assume that the companies that transacted in that quarter were transactions in process prior to COVID, and there's maybe a little selection bias towards more quality deals that were able to get executed. But even since then, looking into Q3 and the opportunities we're looking at right now, um, the markets are still very competitive. It's still a seller's market if you have a quality asset. And the valuation expectations are very consistent with what we've seen prior to the pandemic. Um, to the prior comment on the use of structure, um, just given the uncertainty 
it is more difficult to get to those full valuations, but the expectation is there that you need to find a way to do that. Um, at the same time, lenders have been a bit more conservative, so you're seeing more equity into deals, a little bit less leverage, um, and that creates this gap of needing to utilize structure. Um, so in a lot of the deals that we're looking at, both on the buy side as well as um, an opportunity that we're exiting, um, there is certainly more acceptance within the market of using earnouts and structure to get deals done. Um, sellers' advisors seem to be more open to using structure, um, and it's just a successful bridge to get to that full valuation, but also balance the risk when there's tremendous uncertainty in the forecast. So some, somewhere to meet in the middle, so you're able to you know, meet that valuation and, and meet the needs of the company, and then the investor can feel comfortable with the way the way they're structuring the deal as well. Yeah, and the way we always look at earnouts is if they achieve the projections, then you paid the appropriate price, the seller got a full value. And if the earnout's not paid, well, then you also paid the right value for the company. So as long as they're structured appropriately and fair, um, I think they can be a useful tool that allows both parties to meet in the middle. Makes sense. And Scott Rosenblatt, one of the one of the key stages uh, for companies is to have the face-to-face -face meetings with potential investors and get them engaged in their companies. How have you seen people tackling this in the remote environment, and has it had any impact on the deals that you've seen? Well, I could summarize it in one word: Zoom. <laughs> so you're seeing a lot of uh, meetings that are happening virtually. And, uh, you know, it has, has a positive negative. There's always something to be said of meeting someone in person. But the efficiencies created by using video conferencing to, uh, to have those same meetings, it enhances the amount of time. It obviously cuts down any type of travel time for those meetings. And people have really adapted well to it. The, the main aspect from, from our standpoint is it's made things more uh, time zone neutral because everyone's available most of the time for video conferencing. And it's it's really accelerated the speed at which you can complete some of these transactions. Yeah, it's it's easier to get people together, and and in a way, I imagine it's easier to get more people to the table, and have have more people in these meetings. And sorry, go ahead. Scott. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I think uh, some of the others on this on the call can uh, you know, can confirm this, but. It allows you to bring more players to the table because you cut down sort of the, the red tape of what it takes to to have all those interactions. So if you're looking at a pool of investors, you may be able to expand it to a larger group just because of the extra access that this is, uh, has provided. Yeah, we've certainly seen that in some of the processes we've participated in. Um, a more traditional sell-side process, you may have five potential investors come to management meetings after that first round of preliminary bids. Um, we've seen some of these process sort of break into a multi-stage process where an hour or two hour Zoom call with management is very doable, easy to schedule. So we're seeing advisors say, let's do a dozen Zoom calls with potential buyers. From there, have interest and valuation reconfirmed, and then we'll get to that more formal um, select few group of management presentations. Um, so it, that's certainly very efficient for the sellers, allows them to um, create a more competitive process. The one negative byproduct of that is it is adding this additional stage in the bidding and is sort of dragging some of these processes on longer than they traditionally would. And Dan, I, I heard you earlier saying that you had a, a a relationship with your investor, you know, pre pre pandemic, obviously, and I'm sure that that relationship uh, kept you through the through the deal as uh, as the at home was beginning. Um, how important do you think it is for companies now to to build those relationships, and how are you seeing it done in the virtual environment? So, I think it's. Critical if you are fundraising to build relationships at least 12 months in advance. When you go out raising money, 
you want to be speaking to mostly companies that are familiar, familiar with the management team, familiar with the industry, and have already uh, expressed predisposition to uh, your company and uh, investing in the industry. So it just allows you to pre-qualify and it allows you to be more focused and uh, run a more efficient process. So that uh, that's a critical, uh, was critical for us and it really helped to, in a time when there was a lot of uncertainty, we had uh, a short list of investors that already knew us, had already done pre-diligence diligence, and they were able to get through the, uh, the, the challenges uh, in the moment because they already believed in the business and they had already looked at, we didn't share uh, a complete data room, but we gave them some insights uh, in advance of the fundraising. So uh, I don't, uh, I'm sure we would not have completed the transaction if we had not uh, developed that advanced uh, uh, relationship building. And it helped us also uh, because we had uh, had prior uh, meetings and uh, dialogue with the company that uh, the fund that had eventually become our investor, and we really felt good about it. We didn't feel like, well, our back is up against the wall. This is really who we were 100% uh, confident that they would make great uh, long-term investors and board members. So uh, that helped us also. Yeah, you're, you were feeling good about it. Yeah. Andrew, I'm going to take it back to you to understand more about the due diligence process. Has there been any um, any changes that you've seen in due diligence, or it's it's fairly similar to pre-pandemic? Um, for the most part, it is fairly similar to pre-pandemic. Um, you know, all of your traditional due diligence streams, accounting, tax, insurance, benefits, legal, environmental, those are all still um, happening as they would, uh, maybe just with the use of more virtual meetings as opposed to in-person meetings. Um, from a cadence of that diligence perspective, you know, one thing we've seen is with the reduction in in-person meetings, um, whereas you may have previously a one to two day on-site, which is a full day in-person meeting each day, doing that over a Zoom call can create a lot of Zoom fatigue um, and we've noticed that you know, it's tough to have an attention span all day in a virtual meeting. So we found it to be productive to break out agendas into shorter chunks. Um, and maybe over the course of a week have three or four, one or two hour Zoom calls as opposed to an all day meeting. Um, in terms of the topics of due diligence, um, you know, all the traditional due diligence streams are pretty much the same. But there's definitely um, more focus on the market and industry, um, really digging into what is the current outlook for each of those subsectors. Um, to a point raised earlier, you're having to do that bit of derivative diligence on industries on, you know, our customers look like they're okay, but what are those tangential impacts that may be impacting us or the business? Um, and then from a tactical perspective, um, definitely a lot of focus on EBITDA adjustments, um, you know, both positive and negative really need to underwrite what is the true performance of the business, teasing out the impacts of COVID. Um, and then there's also uh, on the legal and counting side, um, some additional diligence to be done given the CARES Act. So looking at um, their PPP loan applications and estimates for forgiveness, did companies um, receive any benefits from employee retention tax credits? Were there any impacts from you know, paid sick leave or family medical leave? And all those other CARES Act provisions that have um, created some nuances within the accounting and tax side of things. And Scott Rosenblatt, have, how have you seen investors taking into consideration the, the CARES Act, the PPP loan, for example? How are they looking at it in, in the deals? And actually, you may be on mute, Scott. We, we can't hear you. No? 
I think I'm live. Okay, I can, okay. I can hear you now. All right, uh, from an investor standpoint, it's not as much of a concern. Obviously, it falls into general compliance and diligence that uh, the loan will likely be forgiven. It becomes more of an issue in the exit transactions and how you're going to deal with PPP. If it's a stock deal, the acquirer is going to acquire the company with that loan. So the issue of forgiveness is fairly significant. But even in an asset transaction, which uh, there's a fair amount of in, in this time period, it's equally a problem and it creates, you know, escrow issues and covenant issues in the exiting of the deal. There's just a big unknown and it really depends on the stage of the company. A lot of the PPP loans went to earlier stage companies who otherwise wouldn't have access to institutional lenders based on the size of their business. And this just created an institutional loan for them. So now we you have to deal with something where uh, normally wouldn't be present in these companies. So diligence as to whether or not they have met the requirements, whether the proceeds did go as required by the statute, so that forgiveness will one day uh, result. The other issue is just the timing of forgiveness. Uh, many of these loans are still sitting in limbo. They came from institutional lenders who haven't fully implemented their forgiveness program, and they just say you're in the queue, much like at the beginning of the PPP process when the loans are being made. So there'll be a lot more certainty as this gets resolved and the process moves forward, but it's it's now a limbo item that, that raises concerns. And the timing on the PPP loan forgiveness, it does seem to be uh, pushing out. Uh, I've been seeing that as well. And um, in terms of assessing uh, the probability of forgiveness, what are you looking at in particular? Well, as I mentioned, you can look at the nuts and bolts of how the proceeds were used, but then there's a more interesting issue, which is how will you look at the necessity element? Because one of the requirements of getting the PPP loan was that it was needed for that business. And you could have two extremes. You can have the clear-cut case where, absent this loan, there would have been layoffs, which is exactly what it was designed for. But then you could fall into those situations where a company had recently had a, a decent-sized capital raise, is sitting on a hoard of cash, and yes, they're going to be impacted by the pandemic, but is the necessity there for maintaining uh, basically the, the entire payroll? And you've had a lot of hand-wringing at the board meetings when they were deciding what to do on these loans because they otherwise fit the definition of the, of the intent of maintaining the, the employment, but is the necessity there based on where they're sitting in a cash position? And you've seen a lot of companies who otherwise would have applied at the board level refusing to apply for these loans or, and I think someone on this call has an example of this, returning the money after being approved for the loan uh, because they were concerned about the future repercussions on forgiveness. Because if you're not forgiven due to the necessity element, it's a loan and the company has to pay it back and it's probably already used all the proceeds because it would have been complying with the statute. Yeah, and that's the additional liability on the balance sheet which needs to be considered. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Scott. So I'd like to uh, you know, move over to raising capital and how companies have been getting liquidity during the, the pandemic. So Scott uh, Rosenblatt, let's, let's start with you since we already had you captured there. Sure. Um, I'm going to skip over more of the, the typical type fundraising because that's great for the investors and the companies who that goes. I'll, I'll talk about some of the more interesting elements of what's been happening as a result of the pandemic. Uh, I'm seeing a trend for a lot of companies who are making headway with existing institutional investors who traditionally have money put aside for secondaries to support their portfolio companies. But they want to see support from the other investors. Now, in typical stages of financing for early stage companies, they'll go through the angel investor seed type rounds before they get to the institutionals in the, in the ABC type rounds. And if you've gone through those stages and now you're going back to the well for your C or D round in this time, you see the institutional investors wanting to see buy-in from the existing investors. And this is assuming they have confidence in the company and its future and its management. So those aren't the roadblocks. The roadblock is if I'm putting money in, I wanna see a uh, pro rata amount coming in from existing investors to support. And most deals don't have that built in. So it's a matter of negotiating or restructuring the deal, commonly called uh, a recapitalization, where it's gonna be somewhat of a pay to play. 
where if you're an existing earlier stage investor and you don't put up your pro rata piece of this new round, you're going to get converted to common stock and lose the preference you negotiated for in your investment. And as you can imagine, that is a major point of contention for the earlier stage investors as compared to the more well-funded later stage institutional investors. And that's before you really get to third parties who might be coming in. The third parties also want to see support from the current investment base. So you're seeing a lot of these cram down transactions being, being put forth. The power is to do it there, but you don't normally see those unless you have extreme circumstances and the pandemic and the constriction on, on some of the capital sources is creating that friction and resulting in these, these recap transactions. And do you see the existing investors when they can? Do you see them stepping up and making that uh, additional investment so they can secure their new investment? Or is that more on a case-by-case -case basis? Well, it, it's certainly case-by-case -case because each of these investors have their own issues presented to them. Uh, and it depends on whether what the form is. If it's high net worth investors, they may have made their investments and they're not ready to recapitalize this company. If it's a pool of angel investors and they have uh, money for secondaries, they're more likely to be able to. And it's also a measure of how extreme is the result if you, if you don't move forward. Is the new financing simply in preference to the old and now it's the top tier in the capital stack? Or is it wiping out all preferences and now the existing investors who fail to participate are becoming common stock hand in hand with management? And when that happens, you still have to incentivize management going forward. So you're going to see further li uh, liquidation issues with those common holders. They're going to be diluted by enhancements of stock option pools, for example, to incentivize management and future management. So those investors who do not participate and end up in common are going to be shrunk even more on their pro rata ownership by these enhancements of the stock option plans, which naturally have to result from the recap. Got it. And Scott Hadfield, uh, what are you seeing? I know you're working with slightly later stage uh, companies. Is there anything uh, different or additional from, from what Scott has said? Sure. So maybe I'll pick it up from that later stage or those situations um, where there's debt involved. Um, you know, maybe in just touching on the debt markets, we haven't really talked about debt finance, or debt capital raising too much on this call, but I think um, a lot of the themes on the equity side, are, you know, are, exist on the debt side. Um, the, the credit markets um, remain pretty good overall. Um, they they snap back. Uh, you know, you're seeing certainly some some of the lenders, you know, playing it safe and not, I'll say, active in the market. But most have, you know, for for good performing, good assets, good performing businesses, you're seeing the lending community very eager to put money out and, and lend to companies. Um, you know, there's been a little bit more of a move to asset-based financing that helps in those situations when you have uh, a company that the equity story is maybe not quite as uh, attractive as it maybe was six or nine months ago because of COVID. A lot of the companies, if they have assets, can access an asset-based financing with a commercial bank or non-bank lender and, and get the financing they need. But more on the challenge situation that Scott was alluding to, you know, when there's a lender involved and the company's in default, um, you know, the numbers have been, you know, impacted because of COVID, the lender's also looking for uh, fresh capital to come into business and for the existing investors usually to put up that capital. Um, or, you know, certainly the, each, the, the lender is going to look to each of the parties in the, in the transaction um, to make compromise to come to a solution. So those are the cases that we're seeing the lender amend um, set new covenants, uh, you know, not too many lenders are, I'll, I'll say, haircutting their debt today. Um, you know, we've seen some of that occurring um, with reductions, but uh, that usually occurs with fresh fresh capital coming in um, on a refinance or, or some new equity. Um, so it's it's got to be collaborative. You know, the lenders have been patient. Um, a, you know, really if a company was impacted or doing well and then impacted by COVID, um, you know, there's been amendments by lenders and it's been, you know, I'll say a slow increase of, you know, of performance uh, in those cases. But the businesses that were impacted pre-COVID or um, not performing particularly well pre-COVID that were further impacted in COVID, the lenders have lost patience in many cases and looking for immediate solutions to wrap up and find a solution by year, year end. 
Thank you. And are you seeing, is it, is it easier for uh, debt deals to be structured versus equity right now, or there isn't necessarily a particular trend during the pandemic? Um, it's, it's always situational. You know, typically debt is easier to raise than equity. You have a lot less, I'll say, shareholder matters to deal with, LLC agreements, operating agreements, um, you know, rights between different sets of investors. So, you know, debt is usually a more streamlined, quicker process. But it's it's very you know dependent on the company and how complicated the debt financing um, may be. Um, so it's uh, it, it really is it is really situational around that the, the type of financing being raised. Okay. One one interesting trend I, I could note, Alana, is that at least in in the venture debt market, these companies are looking for extensions on on terms of debt that might be coming due during the pandemic and saying brighter days are in the future. And the lenders are coming back and saying, you know, beyond the typical modifications of interest rate and such, they're saying, if you think it's so bright in the future, I would like some element of equity kicker, usually a warrant position or, or a common stock position, so that if you do turn around this business as a result of the extension of my, my loans, I'm going to share in that upside. So you're seeing them wanting to share in what would otherwise be traditionally an equity upside. Yeah, we've seen that too, Scott. Uh, in fact, I have a current client that um, they, the the lender is going to extend for six months, um, but did ask they you know they had a warrant with uh, specific uh, values on exit in the future. They actually converted to a penny warrant, which gave them immediate immediate equity ownership. You know, upon the extension. Mm -hmm. We're seeing similar themes um, in the middle market PE space. Uh, Lenders seem supportive of transactions and supportive of refinances if there's equity going into the deal. And in some cases, it can be even more symbolic in nature. The company doesn't necessarily need the liquidity, but if the sponsor is writing a check, that's a signal of confidence to the lender. Um, they tend to be more supportive. Um, on the M&A side, uh, you know, there's always been um, the desire to have all parties have skin in the game. And if we're doing um, a transaction, seeing the seller roll over and continue to own a minority position for that second bite of the apple, um, that holds true even more so today. Um, in a period of uncertainty and whenever you have that imbalance of information, you know what does the seller know that I don't know? Um, having that seller roll over for a significant minority position gives us a lot of confidence as a buyer that, you know, we're in this together and, you know, they're confident in the projections of the company. I, I can add a little bit of perspective from Creator IQ's point of view. After we closed our Series C in uh, May, we embarked on extending the bank uh, uh, line of credit that we have and uh, extending the venture uh, debt line of credit that we have. Um, what I found was uh, the venture debt uh, was relatively easy uh, to extend. The, the bank line, I was um, expecting to get a little bit more uh, than we previously had because we just raised $24 million. Uh, that, was, that was more difficult. So uh, banks, um, at least in, in this one situation, were, were being more... I would say more conservative than in the past, but relative to post capital raise, I was expecting them to be a little bit more open. And uh, there, there, there seems to be on the banking front, the experience I had was that they are not as um, not as uh, willing to uh, lend to the degree that they were pre-COVID. Thank you, Dan. And Andrew, just just digging deeper in one of the the points that you were touching on, and uh, the intention for existing management to retain in the companies and to give the new investor confidence that uh, the management want to stay and they see the future in the company. Have you seen? Uh, how have you seen management reacting to that? Are they are they buying in and they're understanding or? management are still at the stage in certain instances looking for ways to exit? Yeah, if it, if the company is performing well, um, for the most part, sellers and management are strongly buying into that case. Um, I think it, it may go back to my comment about 
selection bias previously that a lot of the opportunities that are coming to market right now are businesses that have been performing well. Um, they're the, the good assets, not the troubled assets. Um, we haven't seen a ton of troubled opportunities come to market, um, but it would certainly be a red flag to us if there were an entrepreneur or seller that wanted to sell and was not interested in rolling over. Yeah, and it's it's understandable. And Scott Rosenblatt, have you seen any um, any early exits or are people people looking to exit faster in their strategies than perhaps pre pre COVID? Uh, well, it depends on how you phrase that. I'm not sure they're looking to exit earlier, but I think you are seeing a trend in some companies where they try and tap the capital markets to increase their runway through an equity raise, and they're they're not successful, and they're getting pushed in the arms of strategic buyers, and uh, where they rather management would rather and the investor base would rather see a longer runway to grow the overall value of the company before the exit you're just not seeing the same optionality and sometimes you're seeing the strategic exit prematurely. You're also seeing an interesting trend now towards use of SPACs because that's another potential fundraising avenue, but it's really the sale of the company to a, a, a previously public entity. And then they use that vehicle to raise capital where they wouldn't in their private company structure. I'm seeing both those trends happening to companies where I would assume they would have stayed private and in control and raising capital in, in a normal environment. Yeah, and, and that's increased activity in the SPACs then than what you would have seen before the pandemic. Yes, flavor of the month. <laughs> and Scott Hatfield, just to check from you as well, are, are you seeing um, early exits or you know eagerness for an early exit on your side? Um, yes, I mean, the, as I think the point was made, Andrew, I think made it the business, you know, we're, we're, it's a very vibrant, mar vibrant market for businesses um, raising capital or deciding to sell if they're performing well. There's, there's less transactions in the market today. So there's a bit of a scarcity value. So the companies that are performing well in the market today um, are getting a very good look from investors and buyers and many times leading to a higher valuation that maybe they would have received um, Pre-COVID, um, because of that scarcity value and the, and the number of high-quality businesses in the market today, we're also seeing, you know, with because of the, the strong performance of the public markets, um, the strategic buyers are willing to pay a lot and are active. They're well financed and capitalized, so they're in the market, and that's obviously keeping valuations high. In many cases, they're taking a proactive approach to acquiring businesses. So these are companies that are not in a process. Um, we've been retained numerous times over the last six months for buy side acquisitions where we specifically target companies to be acquired by large strategics. And uh, I know one particular situation, we have five companies in active dialogue, three of which went under LOI by a, by a strategic just in the last you know 45 days. So it's, you know, it, from that side, again, there are, there's a lot of liquidity in these large public companies also. And they're 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 acquisitive um, in the market. One other thing on the topic of early exits that we've heard from a few folks, um, and this pertains more to institutional owners of companies, is um, in a portfolio of investments. Given COVID, um, an institutional owner may have a few troubled assets and things they're having to devote a lot of time to, um, and that are underperforming. So if they have other assets that are performing very well and they can chalk up a win through an early exit on those and focus more of their attention on the investments that need it, you know, we're seeing a little bit of that. Thank you, Andrew. And we just have, we have uh, about five minutes left in our webcast. So I wanted to uh, bring together some of the Q&A from, uh, from the audience. So. Scott Hadfield, we actually have a question uh, directed to you, and it's how are you seeing deals impacted when there's a balance sheet dis uh, destruction that has been and has continuing to occur since March, particularly in the hardest hardest hit sectors such as hotels and restaurants? Yeah. Um, 
You know, I, I will say that those situations um, can certainly benefit by um, it, uh, by having a, you know folks um, you know, on the advisory side that are experienced and working in those situations that are, I'll say, knowledgeable and experienced in talking to lenders um, to find a solution. And uh, obviously, that means good counsel, good accounting firms that you know all the way around. Because I think that you know these are they're challenging situations. Um, from the advisory standpoint, as an investment banker, you know we're really trying to position the company in the best way possible. So it's that it's that time spent with the company, understand, you know, what's the how do we best I'll say position this company to to go forward, um, and have those hard conversations with the existing lender, or position the company to raise capital in the future with new for new capital and or refinancing or new equity. Um, so you know these situations. Um, you know, it, it, it helps to have an advisor in these situations rather than the business owner uh, who's basically trying to negotiate again, you know, with a lender, um, you know, with other shareholders potentially and, try, you know, trying to do it themselves. It, it's very hard in a restructuring to do that without, without hope and without a solid advice. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And uh, Scott Rosen, but do you have anything to add, or or you have a similar view to uh, to Scott H? I think we're seeing a similar trend. It's really in a case by case, and it depends on which industry. I mean, the industries mentioned in that question are, are some of the hardest hit, so it's a you know it really depends on a company by company. And Andrea well, wants to turn. Oh, sorry, um, so I was just going to add to that, you know, what we're trying to oftentimes do in those situations is work with the existing lender to really allow the company to to, to see another day, to get to the future. I have a client who um, provides product to the movie theater industry. We're just trying to obviously get them through a period of time here to allow them to um, uh, to see better day and obviously for the industry to improve. So I think that's a lot of the things we have to do. If that means... Um, you know, again, uh, amending the credit facility and, you know, significant amendments um, or the lender providing more liquidity um, to see through. I mean, those are all the things that we look at to, to find the solution uh, in those situations, because it, it's it's hard with a, with an industry that is so impacted today that doesn't have the visibility. Um, you need to just, you know, you need to just keep things going long enough for, for things to improve. So one, one example that comes to mind in one of those industries I alluded to it earlier is in, um, you know, aerospace. And the company I'm thinking of in particular is in the midst of renegotiating with its long-term lenders, providing equity support to those lenders to, uh, to allow them to do the extension, but still going back to their existing equity base and having them pony up the dollars, one, to make the lender more comfortable, and two, to give additional runway. Because even though the lender will extend the terms, they're not providing more financing. So you still need to extend the runway and then sell the vision of, you know, and, and this is not a six month, this is probably, you know, two or three years down the road before that particular industry really recovers. Thank you, Scott. So that's really coming to the end of our web, webcast today. And I want to just take the last minute or two to thank each of the panelists, Scott, Scott Dan and Andrew. And it was definitely for me an interesting conversation today and I appreciate you taking the time. I hope for the audience as well, you enjoyed the discussion today. Please look out for us on our ne next webcast, which will be coming in November. And now we'll hand it over to Sean to wrap up the webcast today. Great, thank, thank you, you Alana. Alana. We hope everyone found today's webcast insightful. A huge thank you to our panelists for sharing your perspectives and experience on raising capital during a pandemic. We encourage you to tell us what you thought about today's webcast by completing our feedback form by clicking the button on the right-hand side of your screen. Please click that button now. We also invite you to reach out to any of today's presenters or myself with any further questions. Thank you once again, and we hope you all remain healthy and safe. Enjoy the rest of your day.